Welcome back. Just to, again to thank our audience, in particular to thank our panelists who have um, excellent presentations on the first panel. Um, some of you have traveled at great distance. Um, really great discussion this morning, I thought. <clears throat> My name is Jennifer Cook. I'm director of the Africa program here at CSIS. I'm playing a moderate role here, moderating. Um, if the dinner uh, last night is anything to go by, my, my timekeeping will be essential. Uh, our panelists have a lot to say, and a lot of it extremely interesting. Um, so we're going to talk uh, now about regional interactions and trilateral regional south-south cooperation. Um, we have three distinguished guests with us. We have. Um, Priya Balasubramaniam Kakar, who is a, a senior public health specialist at the Public Health Foundation of India. Uh, her work in India has involved building capacity in the field of evaluation uh, through incorporation of evaluation philosophy and techniques into core public health training. Um, sh uh, she will talk um, a little bit about South-South cooperation from an Indian perspective. Uh, we have Jonathan Hale, who's the Deputy Assistant Administrator for Europe and Eurasia at USAID. Uh, his responsibilities include management of strategic planning, policy, and implementation <coughs> for AID's programs uh, spanning 15 countries in Europe and Eurasia. He represents USAID um, as the interlocutor with the National Security Council, the Department of State, and other U.S. government agencies regarding uh, policy and programming. We have Dr. Marianne Jacobs, who is the Dean uh, of the Faculty of Health and Sciences uh, and Director of the Global Health Initiative at the University of Cape Town. Uh, she is Chair of the Board at the African Population and Health Research Center. Uh, she is President of the African Medical Schools Association. Um, she's on the Board of the African Platform for um, uh, Health, uh, health uh, Human Resources, Health Resources, well, Human Resources and Health. I'm sorry, I only have the acronym. And she's formerly chair of the board of the ICDDRB, Bangladesh, chair of the board of CORED, um, uh, former uh, WHO Advisory Committee on Health and, and Research. Um, really, we're delighted to have you here, Dr. Jacobs, and talk a little bit from the South African perspective. Finally, we have uh, Dr. Felix Rosenberg, who's director of the Itaborai Forum on Public Health on Health Policy, Science, and Culture at Fiocruz, Brazil. Uh, Dr. Rosenberg is also the Acting Executive Director of the Union of South America Nations National Institutes of Health Network. I, I'm, I'm botching this introduction. Name. is a long name. And uh, the Acting Coordinator and Executive Secretary of the Community of Portuguese Language Countries National Institutes of Health Network. Okay, my job is done now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, we've asked the panelists to talk a little bit about the possibilities um, for health cooperation, south-south cooperation, trilateral cooperation, um, among the BRICS or, tri uh, or north-south, south-south, and, and so forth. Um, getting to how important is the idea of south-south cooperation to these individual countries and their global health outlook? Uh, what are the challenges and opportunities presented uh, by horizontal or trilateral cooperation? It always sounds good in the theory. It's sometimes much harder to implement. Uh, and what are the advantages, disadvantages uh, to fostering cooperation on health within a regional uh, context? Um, so we're going to begin with Priya, um, who has uh, PowerPoint. Um, and I'm going to ask, I'm going to give a one minute warning. We have a full panel with lots to say. So I'm going to try to keep good time so we have time for questions and answers. Thanks, Priya. Thank you, Jennifer, for that very warm introduction. And thank you, um, Catherine, for inviting me uh, on behalf of CSIS. Um, it's indeed a privilege to be here this afternoon among uh, a, a sea of experts, especially in the field of policy and diplomacy. Um, I'm going to share a little bit of the work that we at PHFI have been engaged in in India. Um, and in terms of relating that to what we are talking uh, about today, both in terms of South, South dialogues and regional cooperation, it would appear that my answer is already a little biased towards actioning South-South collaborations. Um, 
What we have been, or rather what I have been involved in the last one year is one of India's largest, I would say, since the Bohr and Soki report of 1946 policy exercises. India has finally decided to go to the route of universal health coverage. And uh, the Public Health Foundation of India was commissioned to be a secretariat to a high-level expert group that looked across seven terms of reference to provide recommendations, guidelines, and a way forward for India to achieve universal health coverage for its 1.2 billion citizens over the next 10 years. Um, India has always been, uh, you know, bandied and bracketed as a, as a global power, emerging power, bricks, mortar, whatever you may want to call it. Um, I'm not a diplomat, I'm a public health scientist, and I'll speak in that context. Um, at the recent Time magazine article says very clearly that with so many of the world's economies in tatters, and the combined might of China and India could spearhead global growth in the coming decades, are they up to the job? So this will allow me to set a little bit of the context for universal health coverage. Um, I am a public health specialist, so forgive me, I have to look at health metrics one way or the other. But it might give you some context as to how and why India decided to approach health with the kind of rigorous um, and almost disciplined agenda that they have uh, come about with um, as commissioned by the Planning Commission. Um, India is a, is, a, is a growing economy. It's a large, chaotic democracy. And it has a lot going for it. But despite economic growth, um, a lot of diplomatic dialogues in India have traditionally focused on trade and investment. Health has often been relegated or often neglected as something that actually takes away resources from the country. Uh, but evidence has now pointed very firmly in the direction that health is a key driver to economic growth. And like education, health has to be looked upon as an investment in this country, not only within a national context, but within how India perceives itself in the global arena. Uh, quickly going through some of the metrics here, we have one of the largest numbers of underweight children in India, 46% under three years, current infant mortality rates of 50 per, five, per thousand live births. The maternal mortality ratio presently stands at 212 per 100,000 live births. All these are challenges to meet the national and MDG goals of 38 per thousand and 100 per 100,000 by 2015. We're still lagging. We have a huge rising burden of non-communicable diseases that Julia had talked about uh, uh, a little earlier. Uh, but what's very interesting is that we face a dual burden. We face a burden of non-communicable diseases. We also face a burden of infectious diseases. So becoming rich, being empowered, only gives us that much more to deal with. So we deal with uh, the, the lifestyle diseases of the rich, urban spaces, diabetes, hypertension, tobacco deaths, and then we deal with disease of poverty, malaria, tuberculosis, a couple of incidents of polio, which are supposed to have been eradicated. And then infectious diseases, avian influenza, chikungunya, SARS, the list is endless. What's interesting in India is that uh, the private purchase of healthcare in India is huge today. Um, about 60% of healthcare in India is now provided by the private sector. Um, the private purchase of drugs and the purchase of healthcare services constitute 78% of the country's total health bill. Of this, 72% is due to out-of-pocket expenditures on drugs alone. So if you lo actually look at this, the combined rural and urban uh, uh, impoverishment due to out-of-pocket payments for healthcare in India are huge. I mean, it started from about 26 million 
in the mid-90s and ratcheted up to 40 million in 2004 and 5. So why is health system uh, reform needed for the country? More, 18% of all episodes in rural areas and 10% in urban areas have no health care at all. 28% of rural and 20% of urban residents have no funds for health care. 40% of hospitalized persons have to borrow money or sell assets to pay for their health care. Over 35% of hospitalized persons fall, fall below the poverty line. And 2.2% of the po population may be impoverished simply because of hospital expenses. So this sets a little bit of the policy context for this exercise. Um, a high-level expert group, as I'd mentioned earlier, was convened uh, by the Government of India to mandate a framework for universal health, and the Public Health Foundation uh, was appointed as secretariat. The review process for this document was interesting. Rather than view this as just another policy exercise to collect dust in the Planning Commission, we didn't know the future of this report, what would happen to it. Uh, what was interesting is that it was complemented with the experience of other countries. It highlighted what worked, what was relevant, what could have been replicated, along with limitations of various approaches. And this is where the context of both South-South dialogues and also uh, interaction with regional level partners and players within the geopolitical context of India comes into play. The report consulted a slew of network of experts from Brazil, China, South Africa, more importantly, our neighbor in Thailand, as, and others as well, North America, Britain, Europe, the OECD countries, the World Bank, the WHO. And then we look at disparities. I mean, India is, a geogra is, a, is geographically a heterodox. Huge diversities, huge population. I mean, just looking at the infant mortality rate, Madhya Pradesh, 72 by, over, by 4,000, Uttar Pradesh, 69 per thousand. Tamil Nadu, drastic reduction, 35. What an aberration. Kerala, even lower, 13. The neonatal mortality rate varies from 11 in Kerala to 53 in Odisha. That's the kind of disparities that the country is looking at. Now, how do we compare with some of the other countries? If you look at infant mortality per thousand live births, we have 50, China 17, Brazil 17, Sri Lanka 13, Thailand 12. Under five mortality per 1,000 live births, India 66. China 19, Brazil 21, Sri Lanka 16, Thailand 13. Percentage of children who are fully immunized, 66 in India, 95 in China, 99 in Brazil, 99 in Sri Lanka, 98 in Thailand. And our immediate neighbors, Bangladesh has 85% of all children immunized by the age of one, and Nepal, 80% immunized by the age of two. Birth by skilled attendance, similar metrics. And what about public spending on health? India, 33% uh, of total public spending as per GDP, 4.1 total public spending. Public spending on health as percentage of GDP, 1.4, but this is an overestimation, it's about 1.2. Sri Lanka, 1.8, China, 2.3, and Thailand, with the achievement of universal health coverage, 3.3%. The same with hospital bed capacity. Where do we stand? Between Sri Lanka, it's 3.1, China, 3.0, USA, 3.1, UK, 3.9, and India, 0.9%. There's a huge disparity here. So where does this all lead to eventually? Um, I mean, historically, while financial protection was a principal objective of this in initiative for universal health coverage, it was also recognized that dealing with universal health coverage spans infrastructure, the health workforce, um, access to healthcare services, reforms in management, the participation of communities and civil societies, access to affordable medicines, healthcare protection and financing, and last but not the least, social determinants of health. This was actually added on. It wasn't part of the original terms of reference. Uh, and it was found that social determinants of health have a profound influence 
not only on the health of populations, but in, more importantly, in their ability to access health. And that, and therein lies, one of the main challenges of the healthcare system in India today. There was, there was additional focus on urban health, gender, the role of public-private partnerships, and information technology-enabled health services. So what was our vision for universal health coverage? It was seen as a universal health entitlement for every citizen to a national health package of essential primary, secondary, and tertiary health services that will be funded by the government. And what does this mean for India uh, in terms of universal health coverage? What was the pulse that we were getting from the government? Uh, for once, it seemed to us that to the government of India, the kind of political will that went behind this whole exercise, universal health coverage meant a lot of things. It meant greater equity, a great leveler for a country with huge social and political disparities. It meant improved health outcomes, which reduces spending on health. It meant an efficient and accountable and transparent health system, free from corruption. It meant reduction of poverty, it meant greater productivity in a country that's crippled by a slew of chronic and non-communicable diseases. And it meant increased jobs. Uh, an estimated 24.5 million jobs are estimated if universal health coverage is brought about in the country today. So the provision of health care would mean strengthening of public services, especially primary health care. And for this, we look to our partners in Brazil, we look to our partners in Thailand. We look to our partners as far as Kyrgyzstan and Sri Lanka and looked at how they strengthened and focused on primary health care to bring about greater equity and lower costs in providing universal health care. Uh, we have suggested that private providers of health be contracted into the system as per need and availability with defined deliverables and ultimately integrating primary, secondary, and tertiary care aspects of health through these networks of providers, public, private, and public and private partnerships. And all this would be regulated and monitored for cost and health outcomes. Uh, I'm not going to dwell too much on this. I know there's a paucity for time, but I'll give you a few key recommendations. The first one was the government should increase public expenditures on health from the current level of 1.2% of GDP to at least 3.5% at least 2.5% by the end of the 12th plan, and to at least 3% by 2022. The second quick win that we wanted was the availability of free essential medicines by increasing public spending on drug procurement. I repeatedly heard in the previous session that India has this fantastic pharmaceutical industry, huge manufacture of generic drugs, they bring down the cost of drugs. But the reality is a lot of these drugs are simply not available for the Indian market. You walk into a public hospital in Chennai or Delhi, you won't find drugs. And that's one of the key deterrents of people going into the public system, using public services, because they simply don't have the medications. They go outside, they buy drugs in the free market. Some of these are spurious, some of these are about cost, and eventually, that's where the 72% goes of OOPs uh, towards drugs. And finally, general taxation as a principal source of healthcare financing, complemented by additional mandatory deductions from salaried individuals and taxpayers, either as a proportion of taxable income or as a proportion of their salaries. Um, we've also advocated the removal of user fees for national health services, and this applies for even those who have the financial capacity to pay. The reason is because I think the group viewed, the expert group viewed um, univer uh, universal health coverage as, as, as something that transcends the narrow, often inadequate, and sometimes inequitable uh, um, definition of universal coverage as universal health insurance. Uh, what India looks at and what this particular group looked at in terms of universal health coverage was it moved beyond the realm of insurance and went to the realm of assurance where every Indian citizen was assured of basic health care. Um, we recommended a package of financing that was flexible with differential norms 
uh, that would be proposed to states who are very, very powerful players of healthcare access and delivery in India and recognizing both physical and sociocultural diversities of these states. The other quick win that we went for is the 15% allocation of public funding for health to drugs. And the state must procure all essential drug list medicines. They should be centralized procurement, quality generic drugs should be insured, and warehouses at every district level. We borrowed heavily from the Brazilian model here. Um, these are some of the management reforms that we have suggested, but in the paucity of time, I will not pause here. But let's move on. So what are the immediate health, what are the immediate outcomes to this whole exercise? It's interesting. Uh, we had an interesting conclave on the 27th of November where we invited a slew of international experts to comment. They came from different countries, India uh, itself, local experts, Sri Lanka, Brazil, and experts from multilateral agencies, WHO, the World Bank. Um, they not only gave their comments on the report, but they also evaluated it and shared some of their comments with the Planning Commission when the report was formally presented to the Government of India on the 28th of November. On December 1st, the Deputy Chairman of the Planning Commission, the Planning Commission, by the way, is the money bags of, uh, of the Indian government. They hold uh, the purse strings and also determine how much spending health would get for the country. Uh, Montek Singh Aluwalia, the Deputy Chairman of the Planning Commission, announced in public uh, what I perceive is a major coup of this entire exercise, that healthcare spending in India is to go up by 2.5% in the 12th five-year plan, which actually is being compiled as I speak, and will be released and tabled in Parliament by January of next year, 2012. And that's it. That's the immediate quick win that we achieved, is pressing the government that for any kind of health reform, any kind of health parity, we need the funds to make it, uh, to, to achieve some of those goals. Here's another headline. Uh, here's how the United Party Alliance, which is the current ruling party of India, can seduce the common man, universal health care, as a game changer that will <coughs> truly reform India. And finally, a third one, by the Times of India, December 5th, that's yesterday, after many wrongs, the Planning Commission has just got it right. Universal health coverage to become a reality in the upcoming five-year plan. And then, as we debate the quick wins on generic drugs and the essential drug list, the Business Standard publishes one on the 30th of November, should drug prices be regulated, and calls for transparent and more objective price regulation. Uh, G, uh, DG Shah is uh, from the Ministry of uh, Health and Pharmaceuticals and has instituted a new policy that it looks at drug pricing and competitive bidding in a more transparent manner. So, I think in some ways, uh, by the institution of a policy like this and the fledgling uh, steps towards universal health coverage, we have charted our own small road to global health policy. I do believe that India has firmly joined the global movement towards universal health coverage and care. Perhaps it could, in, in its own way, be a leader in the future. And universal health coverage in this context places health in the center stage of global country agendas. When you look at our fellow countries, Thailand, Sri Lanka, countries in Europe, Spain, um, and countries in the developed world, Canada, New Zealand, um, um, and, uh, and the UK. These are all countries where universal health coverage has evolved as a movement. And by India firmly, uh, but positively joining this, we have, I think, in our own way, uh, positioned ourselves in a global space where the priorities, where the national priorities of health will now start defining our global priorities in health. So why a South-South context? Um, it's interesting because I think Peter in the earlier, uh, uh, in, his, in his very beautifully articulated speech had, had talked about the uneasiness of the BRICS and the evolving, shifting dynamics of the various agendas of different countries. I cannot speak for the BRICS uh, except that India has to first look at its own national agenda before 
determining its space in the global arena. Uh, some similarities in terms of why South-South dialogues would work, a similarity in terms of environment, in terms of political, economic, and historical and geographic uh, agendas in countries, uh, for example, Bangladesh, Thailand, Sri Lanka, and some of the ASEAN countries have a very close agenda with India, both in terms of historical, political, and economic context, living conditions, disease dynamics, non-communicable and chronic disease affect parallel countries in the region at the same time. Bangladesh has had the tsunami crisis, huge resurgence of infectious diseases. Pakistan had the earthquake, a huge resurgence of infectious diseases there. And uh, health systems, the ability to learn from each other's health systems and put into place mechanisms that can make uh, health systems within the country work better based on proven agendas in other countries. So what are some of the opportunities? Health systems, uh, the ability to collaborate on technology, low cost technologies in Bangladesh, for example, the use of zinc supplements uh, has, has greatly benefited maternal and child health. Telemedicine, in fact, uh, based on the SARC agenda, India, Nepal, and Bhutan have actually uh, put together an agreement where they will use telemedicine to effect changes in maternal and child health indicators. Disease surveillance, I mean, this is a huge area of cooperation uh, with uh, avian inf flu influ influenza, SARS, and other, and more recently, the New Delhi metallobacillus virus, the antibiotic resistant strains of bacteria that are coming into the country. Um, using regional cooperation to monitor, uh, survey diseases, and to be prepared for pandemics uh, is a huge area to foster regional cooperation. Affordable medicines, I mean, the use of generic drugs has time and time again been the focus of health agendas in other countries. And it's time that India started interacting with them to talk more about TRIPS, uh, re-evolving India's own generic drug agenda, and also issues regarding manufacturing and distribution of drugs. Primary healthcare. Uh, we are all countries who are grappling with unsanit unsanitary conditions, lack of safe water and hygiene. Thailand actually has 97% achievement of good drinking water and, and sanitation, and it's resulted in a huge drop in their infectious disease rates. Um, and lastly, institutional linkages. I mean, I was just talking with Felix and Marion, and uh, we were talking about PHFI uh, reaching out and, and, and having some collaborations, both inter-institutional and intergovernmental. governmental uh, Political will doesn't always have to uh, foster agendas, but we need institutional uh, linkages to begin some of those relationships. So what are some of the challenges? Uh, I think one thing that comes up repeatedly is political will and a committed leadership to reach out, both in terms of South-South dialogues and regional cooperations. The issue of trust, I mean, once again, this was mentioned in Peter's presentation. India and China view each other with a wariness uh, as adversaries, um, and we have to get over this, uh, this, this geopolitical suspicion in order to work in common health agendas. Um, more importantly, what we also need is a supporting and enable, enabling international environment and partners. And this is where multilateral cooperation and, and organizations can come into play. Where normally you're talking about disease interventions, now perhaps aid could be about fostering regional cooperations, both in terms of research, in terms of surveillance, and in terms of building better health systems. Uh, there's been a traditional north-oriented mindset with vertical links, HIV, AIDS, malaria, cholera, they're all silos. And perhaps now is the time to break those silos and kind of look at it from a horizontal point of view. A lack of shared history, and my time is up, um, and uh, a low level awareness among common problems within countries. And lastly, weak policy frameworks where countries focus only on national goals and uh, are so preoccupied with them that they lose their sense of position in a larger global arena. But having said that, 
If we don't create the future, as Toni Morrison says, the present only serves to extend itself. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks very much, Priya. Uh, let's turn to Jonathan. Okay, uh, someone's going to help us with a PowerPoint. Good morning. I um, am Jonathan Hale. I'm Deputy Assistant Administrator for Europe and Eurasia at USAID. And I'm here to speak about cooperation with Russia on global health and development. And I want to thank CSIS for the opportunity and for the important work that they're doing on the BRICS to start with. Today, USAID is working with Russia as a development partner, while we still also cooperate on remaining challenges in Russia itself. As a G8 member, Russia has expanded its development and global health assistance around the world over the last five years. It has worked and is continuing to work through multilateral organizations like the World Bank, and we heard about this in the first, first panel. At this point, Russia's total bilateral and multilateral development assistance to other countries is about $500 million every year. Russia is in the process of joining the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and at this point, it is not a member of OECD's Development Assistance Committee, but it may be in the future. Finally, Russia is also in the process of setting up its own development agency, which is set to launch this year, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. The U.S. and Russia have a rich legacy of working together on health issues, and thanks to the reset in relations initiated by the Obama administration, the U.S. and Russia have been able to cooperate more closely on a number of global challenges, including those impacting global health and development. Within the Health Working Group of the U.S.-Russia Bilateral Presidential Commission, we're cooperating on scientific research, maternal and child health, healthy lifestyles, and global health issues. And USAID is delighted to be working with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services on these matters and coordinating closely with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And one of the photos you'll see there, it's timely, is Secretary Sebelius in our, in our Health Working Group meeting. Earlier this year, USAID and the Russian Ministry of Health and Social Development signed a protocol to work together to eradicate polio around the world. And in May, U.S. and Russian teams, working under the auspices of the World Health Organization, conducted joint polio surveillance in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. And the pictures that you'll see as, as I speak are from that mission in Central Asia with our experts and the Russian experts together. It was very successful. Our teams visited a number of regional health facilities and accompanied local mobilization immunization teams door to door in order to identify strengths and gaps in immunization campaigns and to provide suggestions for improvement. <clears throat> U.S. and Russian technical and financial collaboration contributed to rapidly stopping the polio outbreak in the WHO European region that impacted at least four countries. And the work of the U.S. and Russian teams help secure determination from WHO's Regional Certification Committee that the region was again polio free. We continue to actively promote cross-border coordination and planning and are looking at our next steps in the global fight against polio. This fall, I also started a dialogue with the Russian Ministry of Health about possible U.S.-Russian cooperation on malaria. And we're in the process of exploring how and where we might cooperate and whether it will involve training, surveillance, or eradication efforts. And the Russians are already working through the World Bank to train African doctors and to take part in other anti-malaria efforts in African countries, where USAID is also active. There's also interest in trying to understand the remaining problems with malaria in Central Asian countries, like Tajikistan, and how we might work together to combat them. I just want to mention a few other areas of bilateral cooperation on global health between the United States and Russia. Later this week, the U.S. and Russia will participate in the delivery of 180 wheelchairs, which are being donated to Kyrgyzstan. And the U.S. and Russia are also deepening cooperation on international disaster response and emergency medicine. We've held a joint tabletop exercise and are now planning an exercise in a third country. Over the last few years, USAID has also supported the deployment of Russian doctors and health experts to African countries, including Namibia, Botswana, Ethiopia, and Tanzania to build capacities needed to fight HIV-AIDS and other global diseases. 
And finally, USAID has been in a dialogue to share best practices as Russia sets up its own development agency. The Russian Ministry of Finance is taking the lead on this agency within the Russian government. USAID recently hosted a study tour to the United States for representatives from Russian universities in Moscow, St. Petersburg, Yaroslavl, and is look, will look to introduce them to leading American universities with development assistance curricula. Another goal of the study tour was to expose Russian professors to perspectives and experience of practitioners in international assistance from the U.S. government, the NGO community, and international organizations. To be sure, U.S. cooperation on development with Russia is relatively new, and both sides are trying to work closely together as development partners, but it's had its challenges. For instance, we've had to overcome the language barrier and clash clashes of institutional cultures between relevant agencies. And of course, funding for any foreign assistance effort today is under strain in the difficult global economic environment. Still, trust is being built on both sides. And as our experience in the health sector illustrates, by building capacity and working together, we can have a significant impact on major global development challenges. There's great will, goodwill on both sides, and it, it's very positive. The US and Russia do not always see eye to eye or share common interests. However, engagement in the health sector has been positive and constructive and we look to continue it in the future and build on it. Where we do face common threats, from infectious diseases to global poverty, we need to continue to deepen our cooperation for the sake of Americans and Russians and the rest of the world. Thank you. Thanks very much. And that begins to get at a question, maybe for, for the question period to our other panelists, on what is it that the U.S. can do to kind of encourage the BRICS to, or support the BRICS in, in that global South-South engagement. Let's turn to Marianne. Good afternoon. Good morning. Uh, thank you to CSIS for making it possible for me to be here, but particularly to Carolyn and Farah and Matt and Jenny and Catherine. Um, I hope that by the end of my 20 minutes, uh, the 22 hours that it took for me to get here will have proven <laughs> to be worthwhile. So I, I've, I've chosen to look at uh, India, Brazil, and South Africa, and not the whole of BRICS, because like uh, Peter, I don't think that the BRICS alliance makes uh, good sense, particularly for global health and global health equity. So if one looks at global health in the 21st century, I think there's a lot to be said for the uh, achievements, uh, the reductions in children's mortality, the technological achievements, but of course, this is juxtaposed with uh, an agenda that still has a far way to go in the world in terms of equity across the world. The response of the world has been uh, a number of phases. Peter spoke about it, starting with tropical health, moving into international health, and more recently in the last 10 or more or 20 years, this phenomenon called global health, which has unleashed a tsunami of global health initiatives public-private partnerships, public sector, private sector, um, threatening actually to overwhelm us. So within all these global health initiatives, the question is what is the place and contribution of the Global South? Can the Global South make a contribution to global health equity? And so in this context, I believe, and I'm going to argue, that it is time to revitalize South-South collaboration. So uh, just a couple of pictures, uh, the history of South-South cooperation, starting with the Bandung uh, Africa-Asian Conference in 1955, moving to the Non-Aligned Movement um, in 1961, IBSA, the G20, uh, the, the technical cooperation among developing countries, the UN program, and then finally the inclusion of South Africa in the BRICS last year. 
So in, uh, in 2009, the UN decided to have a high-level meeting to review progress among these South-South uh, cooperations over a period of 30 years. The meeting was held in Nairobi in Kenya, and these are the, the issues that emerged from this 30-year review, that emerging economies play a lead role in South-South cooperation, uh, they address transnational challenges, there are both bi and multilateral initiatives are relevant. The networking, the interest of emergence of triangular co cooperation, meaning South, South, North. The number of regional and interregional initiatives that are possible. And the place of uh, South, South in global negotiations and trade, finance and investment was made as a clear recommendation. So, Busan. Uh, endorsed the idea of South-South uh, cooperation for development. Um, there, was a, uh, there were several meetings leading up to the Busan meeting. It was held last week. And uh, there's even a handbook towards effective South-South and triangular co cooperation if uh, anybody needs guidance on how to do it. Fairly simple handbook, actually, with a couple of kind of 18-point font guidelines on how to do it. So uh, can India, Brazil, and South Africa then be a useful model for looking at South-South cooperation for development? Well, IBSA was established for three main reasons. Because the three countries share democratic credentials, because of their status as emerging economies that a number of people have spoken to, and also, very importantly, because of their potential to engage in the world with other major global players. So there were three main threads to the, the uh, Brasilia declaration, uh, that IBSA would be a political forum, it would look at cooperation on projects, and very interestingly, that each country would donate a million uh, dollars a year to support poverty reduction projects in other parts of their respective regions. But the whole initiative of IBSA and, I guess, BRIC has challenges. And this is a paper from the South African Institute for International Affairs by Senona, and he asks, can, are these forums neoliberals or in disguise, or are they truly champions of the South that they put themselves out to be? And the challenges that IBSA faces are, um, one of them was raised by a, a question in the last session. Each country needs to look at its economic progress in the world against social uh, development and redress for internal in inequality. And you will know that the Brazil and South Africa's Gini coefficients are among the highest in the world, so we have that challenge. Should there be regional solidarity, or are people actually in it for global advantage um, and, and for looking for global power? Is this just another political wave, or is this truly a global development commitment? And the challenges of IBSA's governance, its plans, its resources and accountability in this really loose alliance that doesn't have a constitution or an overall plan is challenging. So I believe that uh, there is a place for looking again at how health development can be um, accelerated through a partnership between the three countries. These are the key elements of the Brasilia Declaration that are relevant to health. They talk about social equity, about a focus on, um, on a range of uh, social goods, and they talk about the value of exchanging experiences in combating poverty, hunger, and disease as being useful. Uh, don't have to show you numbers. But uh, there are a couple of reasons why I think the, the partnership between the three countries is relevant. First of all, they share a rights framework. The constitution of each of those countries uh, looks at health as a basic human right. And that means that in each country, there is a possibility of a constitutional challenge if the population believe that that's not being honored. 
um, uh, Priya has spoken about, uh, about the issues of universal access, both India, Brazil, and South Africa are all engaged in looking at universal access for their populations. Congratulations to India for their achievement. Brazil's been going much longer with the SUS, and in 2012, South Africa will roll out a national health insurance. Um, South Africa actually has a, a challenge under this issue of the right to health. Peter uh, addressed it very shortly, but this emerged in, uh, in the issue of uh, TRIPS and the right to antiretrovirals. The issue of the right to health on the one hand, uh, uh, civil society felt the state was obliged to deliver on access to antiretrovirals. On the other hand, we had signed the WTO agreement and we were therefore obliged to observe uh, the, the guidelines of TRIPS. In the end, uh, the issue was, was not taken to court. Um, the, the treatment action campaign challenged the state to deliver on its right to health. Uh, the pharmaceutical companies withdrew and I think that um, it was a very interesting uh, issue of the supremacy of, of human rights uh, in the Constitution uh, against an international uh, agreement. The second one talks about why we need to be together, because we can build on the strength of civil society. Um, um, in Social Science and Medicine a couple of years ago, there's a very interesting article on the lessons from building Brazil's national health system, the way in which formal channel, uh, channels were created for civil society to engage with the SUS. Um, at uh, uh, Busan, they discussed the CM Reap uh, consensus on the role of civil society in development. And next year is the third People's Health Assembly, the People's Health Assembly being a global coalition of uh, constituencies concerned with the right to health. A bit of advertising, it's going to be in Cape Town in July next year, beautiful place to come. But more importantly, I think, an opportunity to continue the dialogue that we're starting here. Um, this is a different kind of uh, metric that's not generally used in discussions like this. And I shared it with a meeting uh, in South Africa recently that if we want to look at academic collaborations between our countries, um, the world university rankings are contentious, but if you look at South Africa, Brazil, and, um, uh, and, uh, and, and India, you will see that um, in each case, the institutions in those countries are the first are highest in the rankings in their respective regions. So they have an opportunity to play an academic role if we want to take on that challenge. A second set of metrics looks at what is more traditionally used in science as uh, the outputs in terms of publications and impact in terms of, in terms of the H index. And again, you can see there's a huge gap between the US and UK and India, South Africa and Brazil. It doesn't count, uh, doesn't take population into account, and certainly doesn't take into account the resources that are available to do science and to, and to, uh, to publish. So in terms of these two metrics, uh, between the three of us, our academic institution should be able to make a significant contribution through South-South collaboration. Um, the gentleman on the end there was asking about R&D in the case of health biotechnology. Yes, um, there are a number of collaborations, and in fact, Cuba has the greatest number of biotech collaborations. The challenge, though, is that most collaborations are linked to licensing arrangements and not to resulting in the joint development of new projects and new products. And so there's a need to accelerate innovation and translation, and we have the potential we can do it. So um, what inst institutions are there? The International Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotech has a, has a, has a branch in, uh, in Delhi. There's another chapter in South Africa, and together with uh, Fio Cruz, I think those three institutions can really make magic in uh, biotechnology. Uh, I was asked to say something about regional collaborations. 
um, I'm less um, pessimistic than Peter is. I think that even though the state may not be playing a role in Africa, there's a whole lot that's going on independent of government. Yes, there is a new partnership for uh, for um, advancing uh, for, for uh, economic development in Africa, through which the leaders can pursue cooperation. But there are also other platforms like the Africa Platform on Human Resources for Health, the Equinet Network in Africa, H3 Africa. Well, Africa is not just about uh, misery and AIDS. This H3 Africa is human health and heredity, looking at building capacity for genetics and genomics. And then we've just re-established the African Medical Schools Association. So lots of things going on in which South Africa is playing a facilitating role. And again, with the World Bank, Africa Development Bank and Capacity Plus, looking at community of practice uh, projects with Sean Naronia on the other side. So I believe that the time for IBSA Health is right. Uh, the three countries are implementing universal coverage. There's a prevailing concern about global health governance, a threat of declining ODA, and we have a chance to be the gateways to regional solidarity and health development. So what then are the next steps for our three countries in contributing to the South-South cooperation for um, health development? The first one is I believe that we need to have an active engagement in health development plans. There's the NCD Summit, the World Conference on Social Determinants, COP17 has just happened in Durban, there's a high level forum on, uh, on aid, uh, aid effectiveness, there's a commission on global health governance. I believe that we need to get in there and have our voices heard in there. Because if these different summits are not coordinating their recommendations, I think we can perhaps do it through harmonizing efforts in a, from a southern perspective. The second one is, I think, absolutely crucial for us to get a better understanding of the position of the US and other development partners. So the Center for Global Health Development, for Global Development, uh, published uh, What's on the Agenda in Global Health in 2009. There was a subsequent uh, publication from CSIS led by Helena Gale. Um, and neither one of those talk about support for South-South collaborations. They talk about supporting countries in the South, but not supporting South-South collaborations. And when you look at the governance of global health, the Global Health Initiative in the US, from the tip of Africa, it's very hard to see how we need to engage with quite a complex uh, arrangement. Uh, Busan is, uh, is yet another opportunity, whatever comes out of Busan, I believe we need to interrogate very actively to see what it is in uh, the, the minds of our partners that we can actually benefit from. The third one is, uh, and I have just five steps, is the need for us to review the Brazilian conceptual framework as a model for trilateral uh, partnerships, and I hope Felix is going to talk a little bit about it. Um, this uh, Celia Almeida and Paula Bus published this in The Lancet, but they talk about structural cooperation in health, and they have a set of uh, principles and talk about the need for long-term engagements, which is based on the need of the countries, the need to strengthen whole system capacities and not just bits and pieces like uh, the HIV directorate in, in a government, the opportunity to promote dialogue among actors, and also the need to facilitate leadership in the processes, most importantly to ensure that the country ownership of the, of the agenda is predominant. So uh, we have a couple of things to start with us. The fourth one is claiming the place of the Global South in the plans for new global health governance. So there is a joint action and learning initiative um, towards a global agreement on national and global responsibilities for health, and anyone can join that, anyone who has a passion for looking out for what it is that needs to happen 
to make health development, uh, to accelerate health development, can join the joint action initiative. Um, the new commission on the global governance for health um, is a less open structure. It's led by the University of Norway with Julio Frank from Harvard and Richard Horton, editor of The Lancet. And uh, they've just started up. They've identified about, I think there are about 16 commissioners handpicked from uh, different uh, institutions. And one looks forward to see what mechanism of engagement they are going to use to take up issues like the, um, um, making sure that the voice of the Global South uh, gains greater prominence, particularly when the Commission is led by Northern institutions. The last step, I believe, is moving to action. So what do we do after we've met here? We've come, we've come a hell of a long way. And my hope is that something will happen after today. I think that we need a commitment from the IBSA leadership to make a bigger space for health, um, to look at how the IBSA countries can work more closely with one another on a more expanded agenda for health, to support the IBSA countries in their quest for supporting regional engagement, to truly become uh, champions of the South, of the Global South, and possibly to look at how IBSA needs to interact with the G20 and other fora. The challenge is that if one is only going to look at state actors participating in these uh, structures, you may not get as far as if we look at the non-state actors like civil society and like academic institutions. We are going to need dedicated leadership. Um, I think that the, the IBSA presidents are perhaps have big issues that they are having to deal with other than meeting every uh, couple of years. They're now also having to go to BRICS meetings and there's a chance that IBSA can be dwarfed by BRICS and the original intention to strengthen uh, participation uh, partnerships may be lost. We need a plan, a clear plan, that has a goal, that has values, that has principles, and mostly that has clear outcomes. And lastly, I think we need a monitoring and reporting mechanism that is more than just an occasional report that one picks up off the internet. Um, the, that mechanism needs to track progress with the plan, it needs to show impact, and it has to have accountability. So I'm suggesting that instead of all these high-level forums, maybe we need a low-level forum that can address some of the issues that I've raised here today. Thank you, Dr. Jacobs. Excellent, and uh, right on the nose. Let's turn to Felix. Thank you. Uh, morning. Uh, I think it's always a big challenge to, for, for us, Catherine's uh, uh, pledge to, to speak in very few minutes so huge, large, complex matters. But the third time being with her, I'm trying to learn. Um, I want to thank Marian because she presented the Brazilian conceptual framework and this will help a lot all my presentation because everybody will be sort of acquainted with the basic, uh, the basis of that. I would like to start with, a, uh, I think, a very important concept laying behind all what, what we do or try to do. And that's, of course, I know this is in the mind of everyone, but it's not always stated. Uh, cooperation in global health is a diplomatic tool for international relations, so we have to understand this. We are speaking of diplomacy, or we're speaking of a tool, of a diplomatic tool. And um, so uh, what lays behind this tool, uh, it's extremely uh, complex and varying. Uh, I have listed some of them which are picked up from most of the papers discussing global health and certainly global disease that is 
uh, international disease prevention is one of the major issues laying behind uh, global health cooperation. Uh, of course, uh, international health that is lobbying, getting together to lobby for global policies, health policies is a second uh, drive. Uh, national strategies, geopolitics, I think this is a tremendous, uh, important, very important drive. Uh, national security, that is prevention against bioterrorism, has been one of the big motors of development of global health in the last years. Commercial, uh, international trade is uh, extremely important and uh, many, you will see that many, many of the corporations are dealing with either specific health uh, inputs or products, but not only specific health related products, also other uh, uh, commodities which are insured through this diplomatic tool. Uh, insuring uh, commodities like oil or food stuff and so on, and of course medical uh, products like medical technology and, and services. And then of course there is what I would call the global health market. In the last years there is a huge development of global health institutions, institutions private and public and private public who deal with uh, international, with global health actions and this creates a big employment uh, sector. I mean, many, many professionals are being employed in global health and traveling, and I mean, this is uh, not to be not considered. And last, and I would say, unfortunately, least, also least, uh, we have international ideological commitments, and that is human rights and global justice, is also the drive for many countries or individuals working in global health. It was mentioned Cuba, for instance, today. This is maybe one of the big drives they still have. China used to have it until it still has some residues of that, sending the barefoot doctors to Africa's countries. They are trying to stop it, but it used to be. And many of our countries, they do some, they do international cooperation just because or also because of international commitments. Uh, the strategies I would, uh, normally we speak of bilateral uh, and now including uh, eventually trilateral, triangular relationships and multilateral, which may be regional or international. And I would like to add what I'm uh, quoting, unilateral cooperation. This may sound awkward, uh, but I would say that many of the NGOs defined corporations are almost unilateral. They decide what they're going to offer and donate and to whom and under what circumstances. And what is left to the partner to decide is so little that I think we can call it almost unilateral. Um, however, all of this both the strategies and the, the, the reasons for this international cooperation, I would say they are interrelated and they are mixed. They are not excluded. Whenever we do international cooperation, we are doing all of them with different uh, 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 values for them. But, everybody, but we are dealing with diplomatic relations. We are dealing with social justice. We are dealing with commercial issues. We are dealing with global health market, etc. And uh, um, so we cannot say, we cannot separate them uh, as, as um, excluding reasons. I would say from all this mixture of reasons and strategies and, and uh, increasing uh, global health cooperation actions, what are the outcomes? Um, and I would say there is certainly a very significant global health market, NGOs and consultants and global health related inputs and products. This we can see every day if you, if you look at it, it's increasing very fast. I would say much faster 
than any of the other outcomes. I, I will affirm that uh, in all other areas, there are relatively limited results. Uh, even in, as a diplomatic tool, there are some people, some companions of mine, they feel that global health cooperation is, has a tremendous little influence on major diplomatic relations and commitments in the international arenas. So, and that's why G20 doesn't even speak of, of health. Um, commercial issues, if we compare it with others, it has a very low weight. So I would say uh, it has uh, limited results. It has had as an outcome a fragmentation of health institutions, programs, and systems. We work a lot in Africa and in Latin America, and I would say that although some of the corporations are very important, in general, I'm not sure if the balance, the final balance has been so important because it also has caused fragmentation of systems. It has created parallel programs, parallel systems. Some based on etiology, we have created in many countries the AIDS ministry, the Ministry of AIDS, the Ministry of Tuberculosis mostly, the Ministry of Malaria, and also because of the different agencies. You have private agencies, NGOs, competing with the government programs. And so you duplicate actions and you lose the power, the possibility of having synergy between all the actors and all the uh, disease-oriented corporations. Uh, I would say also we have a dubious uh, effect on specialized manpower because although all this cooperation probably has contributed more than anything else on producing, creating, developing human manpower in health, uh, the, the capturing, the migration, the policies of robbery, as somebody said, of high, high developed uh, resources has really had a tremendous impact on the countries. And uh, uh, let, last, I would say, the emphasis on the donor agenda has often weakened national commitments with national priorities because the donor agenda, that's where the money is, those countries are extremely poor. They don't have financial resources. So many times they have to deviate from their commitments, at least political commitments, in order to receive those donations. So we have to go through new approaches, there is no doubt about that. And for the new approaches, before going and considering some of the resilient activities, I would say uh, we have to consider a dialectic rela relationship between individual, institutional, and government projects. Uh, individual belongs to an institution, an institution belongs to a government, and they are all interrelated. They are not the same thing. One depends on the other one. So we have spaces, opportunities, possibilities of acting by individuals, by institutions, and by the governments, uh, interacting, one influencing the other one. But they are not the same thing. I want to insist on that. And also between the donor and recipient countries. And for that, to consider the relationships between donors and recipients, when I mean dialectic, it means they both influence each other, and from their influencing each other, you get to a new outcome. You produce a new solution. It's neither the donor or the recipient. It's neither the individual or the institution. You get mutual influences. And then we have to consider the levels of asymmetry between the donor and the recipient country. And this is probably the most important uh, thing to consider. If you have a very as asymmetrical relationship, it's very hard to have trust and commitment in the cooperation. So what are the emerging practices? The requirements from our point of view, from Brazilian point of view, is first of all, as Marian put it, it has to be structuring cooperation. That is, you have to help develop and consolidate strong national health systems and health structures. And this is a major consideration. Anything going away from that or anything not going towards that end is not going, it's not solving this big challenge. And this means, I would say, strategic planning comes first. In every corporation, we have to sit down with the country and discussing our different uh, experiences and knowledges and discuss a strategic plan for the country instead of just point uh, uh, specific uh, actions. Secondly, peer, that is horizontal relationships, we have to have a joint learning, both 
countries work in cooperation learn from each other or from the cooperation. It has to be based on mutual commitment and mutual trust principally. And I would say something which probably is going to cause a very big debate in here. I would say only, and this is our view, only with governmental or at least governmentally linked institutions. The question of who represents civil society is a question which has been put forward to today and this is extremely present. Uh, NGOs is something, civil, in Brazil for instance, somebody said we almost don't have uh, NGOs. What we have is civil society participating in the health commissions at the national level, the Ministry of Health, at the state level and at the district level. And they are civil society organizations, but they participate in defining the policies and strategies of the health system in Brazil. Uh, the another thing is to work with NGOs isolated from the government. So we would put this as a premise. We have to work with government or at least government-linked uh, civil society organizations. What is the emerging strategy? What did Brazil, what is Brazil putting forward to solve this and to address these issues? It's to focus on what we would call affinity nations or affinity nation communities. And this is what we do, what we have been doing, that is either regional communities like UNASUR, Latin America, geographically regional communities, which are the strongest, I may say, stronger than any other one. Uh, we have linguistic cultural communities like the community of countries, Portuguese speaking countries, CPLP. And finally, we have economic uh, communities and that is BRICS and probably IPSA. We have to try to include bilateral and multilateral international within the affinity nations communities. We cannot discuss, well, this is a bilateral project, this is a multilateral. We have to try to get the synergies, so include bilateral relationships between the multilateral ones. And whenever possible, I think this is the most important breakthrough, we have to work with through trilateral that is North-South-South cooperation. And we have worked with IAMFI, that's the International Association of National Institutes of Public Health, although it's internationally, it's North-based, you know, because Gates founds it, so it's a North-determined agenda, but still working together with South-South cooperation. The World Bank has worked with us in a fantastic experience with the Portuguese-speaking countries. The US CDC has worked with us in a beautiful experience and very learning experience, uh, challenging experience in Mozambique. We are working with Canada and with European Union now in what we consider the first priority issue in UNASU, and that is to develop uh, national laboratory networks, uh, institutional networks. So our priorities, as I say, are UNASU, and some related countries, like we have a strong uh, work with Haiti and with El Salvador, uh, but mostly South American countries, with CPLP and with BRICS. And from the three, the national priority is certainly UNASUR and probably extending to Latin America in the future. Finally, to finish some examples uh, from our perspective, in UNASUR, we have been working, first of all, getting in the health sector with developing a five-year strategic plan for UNASUR. That means that all of the 12 countries sit together and discuss what is their mid-term cooperation plan. We discuss it together at the same table, the same room. What are we going to do together in order to cooperate with, uh, within, among us? Uh, we have uh, the second thing in order to do that is to develop institutional networks of which the National Institutes of Public Health are a very strong uh, uh, addressing the problem of science and technology, the problem of uh, teaching, the problem of uh, diagnosis, the problem of um, uh, uh, science-based uh, uh, services, active actions. And then the network of schools of middle of uh, technicians, that is uh, high school technicians, which for us, Africa, Asia, and America is still one of the strongest and most important manpowers in health, for health equity. Um, 
we have been working strengthening, I personally, the National Institutes of Public Health. We have been working particularly with Argentina and Peru, trying for them to be then new leaders within this region. I mean, the, the idea is to whoever has some type of structure to upgrade the structure in order to intervene in mutual cooperation and try not to concentrate cooperation in, uh, in Brazil, for instance. This is, of course, may not be shared by others, but I think it's important. As I say, there is a dialectic relation between the individuals, the institutions, and the country. In CPLP, we have also worked with a four-year strategic cooperation plan. We have had worked very much with the networks, the three networks I mentioned, and we have been working particularly with Mozambique and Guinea-Bissau in order to get a regional critical mass. And now they decided, we all decided to eight countries, Portugal, Brazil, five African and East Timor, that we have to concentrate in developing new uh, public health institutes in the countries who don't have it. And that's the smallest countries, that is San Tomé, Principe, Cape Verde, and East Timor. They are islands and they're very small countries. So when you go to an overall international global health discussion, strategic discussion, what people will say it's not cost effective uh, because there are too few people. And I mean, uh, we cannot speak that a country who, who has a small population is not cost effective. They have the right to have their system and their structures as much as any other country. So now we're working together with Portugal in order to try to develop those institutes in those three very small countries. It's a challenge to get finan financing for that, but uh, we are trying to try to solve it. And finally, BRICS then, BRICS has a completely different perspective. Uh, from what I can see now, it has had its first health uh, meeting in China this year. And uh, it seems that health inputs, that is drug vaccines, kits, either for production or for development, joint development, may be the big issue among those countries because they have the basis to do that and to increase accessibility to, to drugs and vaccines in the world, particularly in the South world. Is there a possibility for joint cooperation within, uh, with third South countries? I think there is, for instance, uh, with China to work together CPLP and China, for instance, in East Timor, would be an ideal thing to work in our case with CDC, China's CDC, uh, because they are nearby and they have a more cultural affinities. Uh, we can work with China and Mozambique with East Timor. So the possibility of working and maybe with uh, South Africa, it's a very important issue to work with South Africa together with Angola and Mozambique because there we will get together the CPLP linguistic, our linguistic, with the regional uh, commitments which, which are so strong. So just, uh, I'm just finishing by saying uh, this, uh, we have to work, uh, as Marion already put it, in the same table, uh, discuss together what really we all need, and this is the big difference with uh, traditional donor-recipient cooperation. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks very much for four really thoughtful um, presentations, all of which came at things from slightly different angles. Um, let's open up for question and answer. We have uh, 10 minutes, but we may cut a few minutes into Steve Morrison's time. Um, um, if you don't mind, just uh, let's take a few questions at a time. We'll start with a gentleman in the far back. Um, my name is Patrick Day, and I work for the Voice of America. Um, my question is, in the programs and all this that uh, you talk about, uh, how do you incorporate using media? Uh, because, again, uh, apart from the large boardrooms and seminars, the final analysis is that this information has to get to the, to, to the lowest common denominator, which is the people that are affected. And an important part of this equation is how the, does the information and education um, permeate down to the lowest level? And, and is, is this something that you incorporate in your strategies? Um, because 
the Voice of America actually uh, broadcasts in uh, 42 languages uh, throughout the world. And uh, one of the things that we do is uh, uh, we've partnered with USAID, for example, the State Department, in um, providing education and training to local journalists who, who uh, also bring in uh, experts, doctors and whatnot, and talk at the lowest level on how to, uh, uh, to approach some of this uh, pandemic. Um, hello, my name is Vesna Kutlesic, and I'm with the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development here in Bethesda, Maryland. And my question is, to what extent are children a priority for BRICS um, countries, particularly child health, early intervention, um, education? Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Brian Leamy with GBC Health. Uh, Priya, I think, opened the, the session appropriately with some GDP statistics and, and the importance of health uh, to countries' economics. And I think that the private sector really recognizes that importance as well. And I, I, I was nervous that there would be no mention of the private sector in all of these cooperative um, uh, opportunities. And, and then we, we did hear Felix uh, allude to the idea of the commodities and, and those in, in the pharma business as well as food and oil, et cetera. Um, can you speak a bit more, just anyone on the panel, about uh, engagement strategies for the private sector uh, as they truly represent a big base of their employees uh, for the communities, but also uh, have vested interests uh, certainly in these growing markets? Which uh, may sometimes compete among, among the, the BRICs or the IBSA at least, uh, competitive interests. Was there one? Yes, gentlemen. Yeah, hi. Uh, Brad Titel again from Global Health Strategies. This, I think, is kind of an expansion of all these questions, which is um, as the BRICs become more engaged in global health and global health assistance, particularly. Uh, I was wondering what, if any, role you think the kind of groups that are in this room, uh, particularly international NGOs, uh, could play to help accelerate and facilitate this process in a way that's you know respectful of the strategies and approaches of the individual countries but also hopefully helps maximize health impact. Why don't we um, take these, we'll go, we'll go in the order that we spoke, um, and you can pick off whichever, you, you, you need not answer all the questions, but pick off the one that you think, or the couple that you think are most, uh, you have most to say on. Um, sure. Um, uh, with regard to the first question of how you can engage media, I can speak from, from the Indian subcontext, um, at least where universal health coverage is concerned. Uh, I mean, our next phase of engagement, once the policy unfolds into an implementation plan, is advocacy through the media. Uh, we do have to go down to the lowest common denominator, especially for state-level engagement. Uh, what's also interesting is that a lot of the states within the country um, in, have their own regional engagements. For example, Tamil Nadu uh, does borrow heavily um, from the Sri Lankan model um, and from a couple of the ASEAN countries as well. Um, so under, I, I think underestimating the media is, 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 is a far cry if we have to engage uh, regional cooperation within a larger context. But as far as the universal health coverage movement goes in India, we do plan to not only engage regional media, but even local level media to get the message of health equity across. So uh, it is a huge and, and ongoing part of our advocacy efforts uh, in the next stage. Uh, let's go to John. Oh. Okay, I would just say first on the child and maternal issues, that's a major priority for Russia. Russia's made quite a bit of progress in infant mortality and they actually just had an international conference in early October um, to, to highlight what they've done and also to talk about how it can be shared internationally and I think that that's an uh, area that will be of great interest to, to us in working with Russia in third countries and trilateral cooperation in the future and USAID is actually the um, leader of the child and maternal health subgroup of the health working group of the BPC. So I would also just want to highlight that on NGOs, of all the work that USAID does around the world, capacity building and working through NGOs is very important, and particularly in this part of the world. In, in Russia, 
most of our work, I would say the majority of our work is through NGOs and, and, and working to strengthen the capacity of local NGOs. And that's certainly something I think over time as we develop what we do, we will want to try to continue with, with Russia in, in third countries as well. Okay, so, so on the issue of the media, um, I can only speak from an institutional perspective. Uh, the challenge is often to to translate all these wonderful documents into into formats that are easily accessible to for for popular access, and very often it's hard to get funding for that kind of activity, that translational interface between the production of big uh, big policy documents and big academic documents for that distribution. So in Africa, there is a um, on a, almost an annual basis, there's a uh, forum at, to which uh, journalists and other uh, people from the media are invited to come and learn more about the health sector and also to teach people in the health sector about what it is that they need to do to, to be uh, more accessible to the media. So it's certainly a, a big issue. Um, on the issue of children, I think that, uh, again, in South Africa, there is a national plan of action for children. Uh, children are given special rights uh, in, in the Constitution, and we even have a ministry that deals with children. But the ministry has lumped together children, women, and disabled persons, and the grown-ups always win out against the children. So the important thing is to keep to have some kind of watchdog structure, and fortunately there are several of those in the country. Uh, the question about international NGOs. Um, the, the, the challenge for us is understanding what it is that you guys can do. We don't always know what it is you can do. And very often, um, let, me, let me withdraw that. From time to time, the efforts of international NGOs are tied to consultants from the north that come and sit with us for a couple of days and then a couple of months later, we get the recommendations from the NGO. So I think, I think it's, it's, there's a, an opportunity for, um, for NGOs to meet with institutions from the Global South and work out a new code of practice, a new set of guidelines. And maybe the guidelines that came from the Istanbul uh, discussion from CSOs could help to some extent. Felix. Well, oh, the questions makes they open up in your seminar. Um, I, I think that the question about children is, uh, gives me the opportunity to comment on a very, I think, extremely important issue. Uh, when Julia presented the data on NCDs, we have to be clear that statistics is not necessarily priority. You may have 75% or 80% or 60% whatever in non-transmissible diseases, but you still have the poorest people in the world carrying children mortality and female mortality because they are not taken care of. So we have to be extremely, have extreme attention to that. We certainly, if we control transmissible diseases and expectancy of life expectancy increases, we will have non-transmissible diseases as a major cause. But that doesn't mean that we have solved social justice because the poorest people, they still are dying at the rate they are dying, even in the richest countries, or some of the richest countries. Uh, for the private sector, I always say we st governments are not invited to discuss the strategies, commercial, industrial strategies of the private sectors. I think both are extremely important. A nation cannot develop without the private sector, neither with the state. But we don't have to mix up both commitments because they are different and they have different interests and they have different goals. So. Of course, there is a relationship between health and development, a non-extremely non direct relationship. We have very poor countries which, with the best health indicators in the world, 
with uh, we have the, some of the richest countries, not necessarily with the best indicators. But there is a close relationship. So private sector will benefit certainly from development of the countries. And they have to be, um, they have to support health as a means of economic development. But for the governments, the social development is more important than the economical development. So both private and public have to be partners. They cannot just dominate one over the other one. And uh, finally, about NGOs, uh, here with Jonathan, US, USAID, we'll have to have a very important discussion because this is a major uh, issue. Uh, here is where we have different policies. And if we want to work, and we have to work together in trilateral relations, we have to put on the table this type of issue. Uh, you see PEPFAR, for instance, in Mozambique, about 80% of their contribution is private, is to NGOs. And this weakens the governments. This may strengthen local NGOs, but it does not certainly strengthen national health system. So here, this is a major issue we have to discuss. And when we discuss on trilateral cooperation, we have to put it on the table. It's no, no mean or no way in saying we will not discuss it because we are different. No, we have to put differences on the table and discuss why we have different strategies and how we can come close together at least on some of the issues. Um, I just have a quick uh, comment about the private sector one. I think one, one thing that we're realizing in India is that because healthcare is provided largely by the private sector, and there's little faith in the public sector to have really delivered. Uh, one of the things, one of the strategies uh, that we're incorporating in involving the private sector is to look at innovation. Um, uh, for, 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 for the largest trajectory of, of India's history since liberalization has been um, the ability to deal with uh, failures in the public sector through innovations in the private sector. So whether that's the ability to provide low cost solutions to healthcare in terms of secondary care, innovations in um, addressing healthcare in tier two and three cities, um, innovations in hospital management and integration. Um, so one of the strategies we're looking at in engaging the, with the private sector, not only within the drug and pharma industry, but also within the realms of innovations within the private sector. We are looking at examples not only within the country, for which there are quite a few, but also looking at other nations, and this could involve the BRICS nations as well as other regional nations uh, for innovations that the private sector has delivered on the ground that we could eventually adopt and incorporate for a more equitable health system. We are out of time. Um, I'm going to ask our panelists to step down, but everyone to remain in their seats. Steve Morrison, director of the Global Health Policy Center here at CSIS, oh, is going to give some, and Catherine Bliss are going to give kind of some concluding wrap-up remarks, kind of summarizing some of the big themes. Um, so why don't we step down and turn over to Steve and Catherine. Thank you to our panelists. Uh,